Boa noite. É, a gente vai começar agora. É... Good evening. We will begin our fourth plenary session of the week. We are already at the end of this marathon. Everybody is tired. And today we have a different format and we would like to announce to you that we will be separating the rooms. Uh, in this room, we will have the simultaneous interpretation and the other auditorium will be transmitting the uh, original uh, voices in English. So you can choose which one you prefer. Today for our fourth plenary session, we will have Professor Nancy Fraser, who is a philosopher and a professor at the New School University in New York. Several published works. I believe most of you know her work and her book, Cannibal Capitalism. And we have some of her texts already translated into Portuguese, uh, very successful texts with uh, some partnerships. Unfortunately, the sound is not very good from her microphone. I can't understand the names. And more recently, she, we have Capitalism in Debate, uh, Conversation and Critique, also translated into Portuguese. We also have Professor Charles Post, a professor of sociology. I didn't get the name of the university in New York, I'm sorry. Several publications and reflections about the Marxist perspective. For us, his most uh, popular work is The Road to Capitalism. And very few publications from Professor Post in Portuguese, unfortunately. Uh, one of them is an article which was published in the first semester of our NIEP journal, translated into Portuguese. It's available online for whoever wants to see it. And another one of his works is Marxism and a Racial Question, which is a chapter of a book in Portuguese, which will be launched tomorrow at the end of our mini course. So without further ado, I would like to only thank the professors for being available, although remotely, to speak to us and to debate all the issues that we have been discussing along this week. As soon as they finish, we will open for questions from the public as we have been doing. So before we begin, or to begin, I will give the floor to Professor Nancy Fraser. You may begin now. Thanks very much. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to participate in this conference, uh, unfortunately, remotely. And I'm uh, especially glad to share this platform with Charles Post. I don't think I've ever met him, but I've read his work and admire it very much. And I hope you will translate more of it into Portuguese. So the theme for this uh, session is uh, democracy and oppression. And um, I thought that I would um, make my initial intervention, my, my opening remarks, um, by talking about the crisis of democracy. And I want to try to argue that it's a, a big mistake to view this in the way that it's uh, mainly uh, talked about as some kind of a freestanding deformation of uh, the political sphere, which could be um, overcome or resolved by what I think of as merely political reforms. In other words, by restoring civility, by, as we would say in the United States, cultivating bipartisanship, you know, working together across party lines, by opposing tribalism, by defending truth-oriented, fact 
based discourse. This is the kind of talk you hear from liberals uh, everywhere in the United States, in Brazil and, and beyond. And um, I, I think this is a truly problematic way to, to understand the ills of democracy in the present. These ideas overlook the causal force of extra political society. In other words, they treat the political order as self-determining, and therefore they fail to interrogate the larger social matrix that generates our political deformations. So I want to argue a, a point that I think will be obvious to anyone who is a Marxist, and that is that democracy's present crisis is firmly anchored in a social matrix. It represents one strand of a broader and much more far-reaching crisis, which also encompasses other strands, ecological strands, economic strands, social strands. The crisis of democracy is inextricably entwined with these other strands of crisis, and it cannot be understood in isolation from them. The crisis of democracy, then, is not freestanding. It's not merely sectoral. It is rather the specifically political strand of a general crisis that is encompassing our social order in its entirety. The underlying bases, then, of democracy's present ills lie in the sinews, in the fundamental deep structures of that social order, in the that social order's institutional structures and constitutive dynamics. In other words, it is bound up with processes that transcend the political. And so democratic crisis can only be grasped by a critical perspective on the broader social totality in which it is anchored. So what exactly is this social totality? Many uh, very uh, astute observers identify it with neoliberalism. They note that democratic governments are now outgunned by oligopolistic corporations, corporations with a global reach, which have lately in the neoliberal regime been liberated from public control. They note that democracy's decline coincides with a coordinated tax revolt of corporate capital and with the installation of global financial markets who are now the new sovereigns whom elected governments um, must obey. Observers also note that democratic power is being hollowed out from within by neoliberal political rationalities that valorize efficiency and choice. They note that democratic action is being preempted by treaties such as TRIPS and NAFTA, which lock in neoliberal macroeconomic policy transnationally and foreclose any possibility of robust social and environmental legislation in the public interest. All of these observations are on point, and together they make plausible the idea that what threatens our democracy is neoliberalism. Nevertheless, the problem, in my view, runs deeper. What is neoliberalism, after all, but a form of capitalism? And today's democratic crisis is by no means capitalism's first, nor is it likely, alas, to be the last. On the contrary, every major phase of capitalist development has given rise to and been transformed by political turmoil. Mercantile capitalism was periodically roiled and eventually destroyed by a slew of peripheral slave revolts and by metropolitan democratic revolutions. Its laissez-faire successor racked up a solid century and a half of political turbulence, including multiple socialist revolutions and fascist putches, 
two world wars, and countless anti-colonial uprising before giving way in the inter- and post-war era of the 20th century to state-managed capitalism. Now, that latter regime was itself no stranger to the political crisis, having weathered a massive wave of anti-colonial rebellions, a global new left uprising, a protracted Cold War and nuclear arms race, all before succumbing to neoliberal subversion in our time, subversion which ushered in the current regime of globalizing financialized capitalism. What I'm arguing then is that this history, if we take it seriously, cast the present democratic crisis in a larger light. Neoliberalism's political travails, however acute, represent the latest chapter of a longer story, which, which concerns the political vicissitudes of capitalism as such. In other words, not just neoliberalism, but capitalism more generally is prone to political crisis and inimical to democracy. That's the thesis of my remarks. What I want to do then is to treat democracy's present crisis as one strand of the general crisis of the social totality that must be understood not as neoliberalism, but as capitalism. So I want to argue that even as we understand today's democratic crisis as a strand of the general crisis of the neoliberal phase of capitalism, we should also contemplate the stronger thesis that every form of capitalism harbors a deep-seated political contradiction, which inclines it to political crisis. Now, my thesis rests on an enlarged understanding of capitalism and capitalist crisis, which I've called uh, cannibal capitalism. Many left-wing thinkers have understood capitalism too narrowly as an economic system, and so they focused on crises and contradictions internal to the economy, such as the falling rate of profit and, and so on. These thinkers, in other words, equate capitalist crisis with economic system dysfunctions, such as depressions, bankruptcy chains, and market crashes. The effect, however, is to rule out a full understanding of capitalism's crisis tendencies by omitting non-economic contradictions and forms of crises that are endemic to capitalism. What are excluded, I think, are crises grounded in what I call inter-realm contradictions, contradictions that arise when capitalism's economic imperatives collide with the reproduction imperatives of the non-economic realms whose health is essential to ongoing accumulation, not to mention to human and non-planetary, uh, non-human planetary well-being. So I could note, for example, that, that there is also built into capitalism an ecological crisis tendency right, a, a strong imperative to cannibalize the non-human nature, the wealth of non-human nature that is essential to capital accumulation. I could also mention a built-in social reproductive contradiction in capitalism, which uh, uh, is a, a deep-seated tendency of capital to cannibalize the energies available for care or social reproduction on which the system necessarily depends. And I could talk about the racial imperial contradictions of capitalist society, which uh, include a built-in tendency to cannibalize the wealth and health of racialized populations on which the system depends as well. In all of those cases, 
what I'm suggesting that there is a kind of inter-realm contradiction that grounds a tendency to a type of capitalist crisis that transcends the economic, namely ecological crisis, social reproductive crisis, and racial imperial crisis. So what I'm suggesting then is an enlarged understanding of capitalism. It no longer just an economy, but something bigger, which I've called an institutionalized social order. Above and beyond its economic subsystem then, capitalist society also encompasses non-economic realms that support its economy, namely social reproduction, non-human nature, wealth expropriated from racialized populations. Capitalism understood in this way then harbors a, quite a plurality of crisis tendencies, not just those stemming from its economy, but also those based in contradictions between the economy and its background conditions of possibility, between economy and society, be, uh, between economy and nature, between exploitation and expropriation. Now that enlarged understanding gives us a better way to understand the present crisis of democracy. We no longer think of it as a freestanding deformation of the political realm, but rather as a further strand of capitalist crisis grounded in yet another inter-realm contradiction, a contradiction between the imperatives of capital accumulation on the one hand and the maintenance of the public powers on which accumulation relies on the other hand. This political contradiction of capitalism can be stated in a nutshell. Legitimate efficacious public power is a condition of possibility for sustained capital accumulation. Yet, capital's drive to endless accumulation tends over time to destabilize the very public powers on which it depends. Seen this way, today's democratic crisis is a strand of capitalist crisis whose broader contours supply the key to its resolution. Now, to pursue this hypothesis, I want to note first that capital relies on public powers to establish and enforce its constitutive norms. Accumulation is inconceivable, after all, without a legal framework that underpins private enterprise and market exchange. It depends crucially on public powers to guarantee property rights, to enforce contracts, to adjudicate disputes, but also to suppress rebellions, maintain order, and manage dissent, to sustain the monetary regimes that constitute capital's lifeblood, to undertake efforts to forestall or manage crises, and to codify and enforce both official status hierarchies, such as those that distinguish citizens from so-called aliens, but also unofficial hierarchies, such as those that distinguish free exploitable workers who are entitled to sell their labor power from dependent expropriable others whose assets and persons can simply be seized. These are all forms of public power without which capital accumulation is literally impossible. Now, historically, the public powers in question have mostly been lodged in territorial states, including those that operated as colonial powers. It was the legal systems of such states that established the contours of seemingly depoliticized arenas within which private actors could pursue their economic interests, free from so-called political interference. Likewise, it was territorial states that mobilized the legitimate force to put down resistance to the expropriation through which capitalist property relations were originated and sustained. Then too, it was national states that conferred subjective rights on some 
and denied them to others. It was such states, finally, that nationalized and underwrote money. Having thus constituted the capitalist economy, these political powers subsequently took further steps to foster capital's capacities to accumulate profits and to face down subsequent challenges. They built and maintained infrastructure, compensated for so-called market failures, steered economic development, bolstered social reproduction, mitigated economic crises, and managed the associated political fallout. But of course, as I think you already realize, there's a whole nother aspect of the story. A capitalist economy also has political conditions of possibility at the geopolitical level, not simply the level of the territorial state. What's at issue at this broader level is the organization of the broader space in which territorial states are embedded. And that's a state space, sorry, in which capital would seem to be able to move quite easily given its inherent expansionist thrust and its deep-seated drive to siphon value from peripheral regions to the core. But its ability to operate across borders, to expand through international trade, and to profit from the predation of subjugated peoples, all of this depends not only on national imperial military might, but also on transnational political arrangements, on international law, brokered agreements among the great powers, and supranational regimes that partially pacify, in a capital-friendly way to be sure, a realm that is often imagined as a state of nature, the international realm. Throughout its history, in other words, capitalism's economy has depended on the military and organizational capacities of a succession of global hegemons, which have sought to foster accumulation on a progressively expanding scale within the framework of a multi-state political system. So in other words, at both levels, the state territorial level and the geopolitical level, the capitalist economy is deeply indebted to political powers external to it. These non-economic powers are indispensable to all the major streams of accumulation, to the exploitation of free labor and the production and exchange of commodities, to the expropriation of racialized subject peoples and the siphoning of value from periphery to core, to the organization of finance, space, and knowledge, hence to the accrual of interest and rent. In no way marginal adjuncts, political forces are constitutive elements of capitalist society. They are essential to its functioning. Political power is part and parcel of the institutionalized social order that is capitalism. But the maintenance of political power stands in a tense relation with the imperative of capital accumulation. The reason lies in capitalism's distinctive institutional topography, which separates the economic from the political. In this respect, capitalist societies differ from earlier forms in which those instances were effectively fused. Think, for example, of feudal society, where control over labor, land, and military force was vested in one single institution, that of lordship and vassalage. In capitalist societies, by contrast, economic and political power are split apart. Each is assigned its own sphere, endowed with its own distinctive medium and modus operandi. The power to organize production is privatized and devolved to capital, which is supposed to deploy only the natural non-political sanctions of hunger and need. The task of governing 
capitalism's non-economic orders, including those that supply the external conditions for, for accumulation, that all falls to the public power, which alone may utilize the political media of law and legitimate violence. In capitalism, in other words, the economic is non-political and the political is non-economic. That's an argument, by the way, that was very elegantly elaborated by Ellen Wood, on whom I'm relying here. Now, this separation of the political and the economic is definitive of what capitalism is, and it severely limits the scope of the political devolving vast aspects of social life to the rule of the market, which in reality in our time means to the rule of large corporations, it declares those aspects off limits to democratic decision-making, to collective action and public control. Its very structure, in other words, devise, deprives us of the ability to decide collectively exactly what and how much we want to produce, on what energetic basis, and through what kinds of social relations. It deprives us, too, of the capacity to determine how we want to use the social surplus we collectively produce, how we want to relate to nature and to future generations, how we want to organize the work of social reproduction and its relation to that of production. Capitalism, in other words, is fundamentally anti-democratic. Even in the best case scenario, democracy and a capitalist economy is necessarily limited and weak. But of course, capitalist society is typically not a best case scenario. And whatever democracy it manages to accommodate must also be shaky and insecure. The trouble is, that capital by its very nature tries to have it both ways. On the one hand, it free loads off of public power, availing itself of the legal regimes, repressive forces, infrastructures, and re regulatory agencies that are indispensable to accumulation. But at the same time, the thirst for profit periodically tempts some fractions of the capitalist class to rebel against public power to badmouth it as inferior to markets, and to scheme to weaken it. In such cases, when short-term interests trump long-term survival, capital is like a tiger that eats its own tail. It's a cannibal that threatens to destroy the very political conditions of its own possibility. Now, the nub of this problem, as I understand it, is encapsulated in four words that begin with the letter D. First, capitalist societies divide their economic from their organized political powers. Second, they constitute their economies as dependent on political powers in order to run. But third, because capital recognizes only monetized forms of value, it free rides on public goods and disavows their replacement costs. Geared then to endless accumulation, finally, capitalism's economy is primed periodically to destabilize the very political powers that it itself needs. So here are four words that begin with D, which together spell out a political contradiction that is lodged deep in the institutional structure of capitalist societies. Like the economic contradictions that most Marxists have stressed, this one too grounds a crisis tendency. In this case, however, the tension is located not inside the economy, but rather at the border that simultaneously separates and connects economy and polity in capitalist society. Now, this contradiction, this political contradiction, is inherent in every form of capitalist society, I think, by definition. It inclines every form of capitalist society to political crisis. Still, the contradiction has reached a very severe and acute pitch 
in the current era of neoliberal financialized capitalism. In this era, central banks and global financial institutions have replaced states as the arbiters of an increasingly globalized economy. It is they and not states who now make the rules that govern the central relations of capitalist society, the relations between labor and capital, citizens and states, core and periphery, and crucial for all of those, the relations between debtors and creditors. These last relations are so central to financialized capitalism that they permeate all of the others. It is largely through debt that capital now cannibalizes labor, disciplines states, transfers wealth from periphery to core, and sucks value from society and nature. As debt flows through states, regions, communities, households, and firms, the result is a dramatic shift in the relation of economy and polity. The previous regime had empowered states, at least relatively wealthy, powerful states, to subordinate the short-term interests of private firms to the long-term objective of sustained accumulation. By contrast, the present regime authorizes finance capital to discipline states and publics in the immediate interests of private investors. And the result, of course, is a kind of double whammy. On the one hand, the state institutions that were previously at least somewhat responsive to citizens are de decreasingly capable of solving the latter's problems or of meeting their needs. On the other hand, the central banks and global finance, financial institutions that have weakened state capacities are quote unquote politically independent, meaning unaccountable to publics and free to act on behalf of investors and creditors. Meanwhile, the scale of pressing problems such as global pandemics and global warming exceed the reach and heft of public powers. The latter are in any case overmatched by transnational corporations and global financial flows, which elude control by political agencies that are tethered to bounded territories. The general result is a glowing, sorry, a growing incapacity of public powers to reign in private powers. Hence, the association of financialized capitalism with what has been called de-democratization and post-democracy. In effect, the present regime of accumulation has spawned a crisis of democratic governance. But far from being freestanding, this crisis is grounded in the contradictory, self-destabilizing dynamics of capitalism. What some call our democratic deficit is actually the historically specific thing that capitalism's inherent political contradiction assumes in its present phase when runaway financialization inundates the political realm, diminishing its powers to the point that it cannot solve pressing problems, including those such as global heating that endanger long-term prospects for accumulation, not to mention life as we know it on the planet. In this phase of capitalism then, as in every other phase, Democratic crisis is not merely sectoral, but an aspect of a larger crisis complex, which also has other aspects, ecological, social reproductive, and economic. Inextricably entwined with these other strands, our present democratic crisis is part and parcel of the general crisis of financialized capitalism, and it cannot be resolved short of resolving that general crisis. Hence, without transforming our social order, root and branch. Equally important, the political strand of our crisis now has another face. As masses of people throughout the world are defecting from politics 
as usual. Witness Brexit, Trump, the rise of right-wing populist and quasi-fascist parties on the one hand, and of some left-wing populist parties on the other. Different as they are, these phenomena suggest a widespread resolve to have done with neoliberalism and the parties that have enabled it, rejecting the reigning common sense and rejecting established political elites, the actors propelling these forces are thinking outside the box, contemplating new perspectives and political projects. The result is a new phase in the gestation of capitalist crisis, what was previously a mere conglomeration of system impasses is now a full-blown full blown crisis of hegemony. So now we have two aspects of political crisis, a hegemonic aspect and a structural aspect. They are mutually reinforcing dynamics of the present general crisis of financialized capitalism. I want to conclude by remarking that such crises do not come along every day. They are actually historically quite rare, and they represent hinge points in capitalism's history. Decision moments when the shape of social life is up for grabs. At such times, the burning question is, who will succeed in constructing a viable counter-hegemony? And on what basis? Who, in other words, will guide the process of social transformation? In whose interest and to what end? Past general crises sparked mass mobilizations whose breadth and intensity appeared at times to threaten the capitalist system. In every case to date, however, the result was not capitalism's abolition but its reorganization in a form whose principal beneficiary in the end turned out to be capital. We cannot know now whether the present crisis will produce an outcome of that type, but this much is clear. The struggle to, to resolve the present democratic crisis, like that crisis itself, can neither be sectoral nor freestanding. Far from concerning political institutions alone, it poses the most fundamental and general questions of social organization. Where will we draw the line delimiting economy from polity, society from nature, production from reproduction? How will we allocate our time among work and leisure, family, politics, civil society? How will we use the social surplus we collectively produce, assuming, in fact, we produce one? And who exactly will decide these matters? Will the profit makers manage to turn capitalism's contradictions into new opportunities for accumulating wealth? Will they co-opt important strands of rebellion, even as they reorganize social domination? Or will a mass revolt against capital finally be, quoting Walter Benjamin, the act by which the human race traveling in this runaway train applies the emergency break? Thank you very much for your attention. Um. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I too have... Agradeço muito a professora Ana Fraser as reflexões que ela trouxe aqui para a gente. Thank you very much, Professor Fraser, for your reflections. And now we give the floor to Professor Charles Post. Uh, and we thank you for being with us. Okay. I, get, I would like to start by thanking the comrades from the app for inviting me and accommodating me as well as Professor Frazier, to appear via Zoom, given this is the beginnings of our semester and our employers do expect us to show up at work. Um, I, too, have never met Nancy Frazier in, 
in person, but have read and admired her work as well. And my talk is going to be uh, on, a, on a, taking up this the general theme of oppression and democracy with a focus on the relationship of capitalism and racism. Back in 2002, almost 20 years ago, the journal Political Power and Social Theory hosted a fascinating symposium on the relationship of race and class under capitalism. While focusing primarily on the United States, the debate that ensued raised the issue of whether the relationship of capitalism and racism is historically contingent or is theoretically necessary. The political scientist Adolf Reed initiated the discussion in an essay called The Unraveling the Relationship of Race and Class in American Politics. In this essay, 20 years back, Reed had two targets. The first was a cl the class reductionist argument of many Marxists that race was at best epiphenomenal to capitalist class relations. His second target was what we could call a liberal identitarian claim made by conventional sociologists and others that race rather than class has become the main determinant of individual life chances in the contemporary United States. Reed argued that race and class are, quote, more effectively and more accurately seen as equivalent and overlapping elements within a single system of social power and stratification rooted in capitalist labor relations. Hierarchies of civic status mediate and manage the stratification by defining populations and assigning them ascriptively to what has become, can be, what come, came to be understood as appropriate niches of civil worth and entitlement. Reed, however, also insisted that one could make a case for the necessary relationship between capitalism and racism without a general theory of capitalism, which he insisted was a barrier to grasping, as he put it, the fluid, evolving, reciprocal relations between race and class as nodes in a unitary system of civic hierarchy rooted in ca the capitalist labor relation. Ellen Mason's Wood, one of the most perceptive theorists of the origins and expansion of capitalism, shared Reed's rejection of the reduction of race to an epiphenomenon of class and attempts to treat race and class as autonomous social relations. However, Wood insisted that a robust analysis required a theory of capitalism that provided, quote, social solid grounds for distinguishing capitalist societies and all their diversity from any social form. Wood's rigorous understanding of the necessary relations and processes of capitalism, however, led her to a very different conclusion than that of Reed in 2002. She ended up, she concluded by reiterating her claim that, quote, race is class is constitutive of capitalism in a way that race is not. Capitalism, she argued, is conceivable without racial divisions, but not by definition without class. Race was one of a number of what she described as non-economic hierarchies that help re to reproduce class domination, and that race happens for historical reasons to be a major extra economic mechanism of class reproduction in U.S. capitalism. In other words, Wood ended up insisting that the relationship between capitalist reproduction and racial domination was historically contingent, not a necessary result of the reproduction of capitalist class relations. Now, I believe that neither Wood nor Reed's arguments are adequate to providing a theoretically robust excuse me, Marxian analysis of the relationship of, between capitalism and racial oppression. What is absolutely clear that without a clear under, theoretical understanding of capitalism, its necessary social preconditions, its logic of social reproduction or laws of motion, and its specific political and ideological relations and processes, we will be unable to specify what relations and processes 
are necessary to this form of social labor and what are historically contingent. However, Woods claim that, quote, class exploitation is constitutive of capitalism as sexual and racial inequalities are not is fundamentally flawed. What is correct, I would argue, that racial oppression was not and is not a necessary precondition for the establishment of capitalism. However, the necessary conditions, as she has so eloquently pointed, argued, are the emergence of producers and non-producers who are compelled to reproduce their social position through market competition, through what Marx called the law of value. However, there are strong theoretical reasons to argue that racial capitalism is a necessary consequence of the reproduction of capitalist social relations. Now, in my argument that follows, I'm following the method of Lise Vogel and Marxist feminist social reproduction theorists of gender oppression by trying to situate racial oppression within the real dynamics of capitalist accumulation and competition. Vogel rooted women's oppression in the reproduction of capitalism's special commodity, labor power. She identified three aspects to the social reproduction of labor power, the daily reproduction of workers' capacity to work, the care for those of those who cannot work, and the intergenerational reproduction of the working class. While capitalism had found various ways to organize the daily reproduction of labor power and the care of non-workers, from work camps to single-sex dormitories, old-age homes, orphanages, and the like, the generational reproduction of labor power, she argued, required both the social and biological reproduction of human beings. All class societies, she argued, socially organize the biological capacities, childbearing and nursing, that women's, quote, differential role, that create women's differential role in the reproduction of labor power. Capitalism, she argued, took hold and transformed the main site of daily and intergenerational reproduction, the family household, creating, as she put it, a severe spatial, temporal, and institutional separation between domestic labor and the capitalist labor production process. Women's primary responsibility for the privatized domestic aspects of social reproduction was the matrix for the production and reproduction of gender oppression. Now, the analysis I'm going to present owes a profound debt as well to three Marxian thinkers in the black radical tradition. The first is Du Bois, who rooted racism in labor market competition. While many emphasize the notion of the psychological wage, a term Du Bois used only once in his magisterial black reconstruction, he consistently viewed racism through the lens of labor market competition. In his analysis of the 1919 St. Louis race riot, a white working class pogrom against newly arrived black workers, Du Bois argued if the white working men of East St. Louis felt that Negro workers would not and could not take the bread and cake from their mouths, their race hatred would have never been translated into murder. If the work, black working men of the South could earn a decent living under decent circumstances at home, they would not be compelled to underbid their white fellows. My second debt is to Oliver Cromwell Cox, in particular his pioneering analysis of the specificity of race as distinct from non-capitalist class oppression, caste oppression, and its roots in capitalist imperialism and exploitation. And finally, I'm indebted to Ruth Wilson Gilmore's work on the Reserve Army of Labor. While her analysis of the relative surplus population was deployed to explain the growth of racialized incarceration in the U.S., it has more general implications for the reproduction of all forms of racial oppression in the U.S. and globally. My analysis is based on two key theoretical assertions. First, capitalist accumulation and competition do not homogenize either capitalists or workers. The continued differentiation of the working class is not the result of monopolies or other obstacles to competition and accumulation. Rather, real accumulation necessarily produces a heterogeneous working class. Second, the most basic 
the dynamics. The second theoretical point is that the dynamics of the capitalist mode of production, market competition, and its continuous development of the productivity of labor through labor-saving technological innovation, cannot explain the emergence or geographic expansion of this form of production. The continuing process of primitive accumulation, the forcible the transformation of means of production into capital, and the transformation of small producers into wage laborers, requires political legal coercion, and in many circumstances, does not immediately produce specifically capitalist class relations. The creation of these relations and their expanded reproduction through competition and accumulation, I will argue, provide the matrix for the production and reproduction of race. The claim that a competition and accumulation homogenize conditions of production and with it profit rates and wage rates and conditions of work confuse Marx's account of real competition with the neoclassical economist's idealized version vision of perfect competition. In perfect competition, numerous firms are passive price takers, and any firm's market advantage is temporary at best, producing uniform profit rates and wages across firms and sectors. This vision of competition makes the existing order appear efficient and just. Real competition has little to do with the dream world of neoclassical economics. Real competition is fought through what Marx called the heavy artillery of fixed capital, constant technological innovation taking the form of increasing mechanization of production. As Anwar Sheikh argued, real competition, antagonistic by nature and turbulent by nature, turbulent by nature, is as different from per so-called perfect competition as war is from ballet. Capitalist accumulation and competition constantly differentiate working people. The rising capital intensity of production necessarily generates a reserve army of labor for capitalist accumulation. The reserve army differentiates workers in two key ways. First, the reproduction of the reserve army constantly replenishes the supply of cheap and precarious labor by differentiating workers between fully employed, partially employed, and unemployed. Put another way, the growth of, <coughs> excuse me, of cheap and precarious labor, I'm sorry, excuse me. Put another way, the growth of relatively high-wage capital-intensive industries creates pools of low-wage workers for low-wage labor-intensive industries. Secondly, the existence of the reserve army limits labor mobility from low-wage to high-wage jobs. This ensures a supply of cheap and precarious labor for low-wage employment in both capital and labor-intensive sectors of the economy, continually differentiating, creating differentiation not only between the two sectors, but within those sectors. The rising organic composition of capital, the increasing capital intensity of production, generates both a reserve army of labor and differentiates profit rates, wage rates, and labor processes within and between different branches of capitalist production. In the competitive war of all against war, all firms with older investment in fixed capital have difficulty reducing unit costs and raising profit margins. However, they cannot abandon these investments immediately in favor of new and more efficient methods. Capitalist investment in buildings, machinery, and the like create barriers to immediately adopting new techniques or exiting a sphere of production. Capitals with older and less efficient capitals, the non-regulating capitals, have no choice but to remain in business until their investments are amortized. They compete with state-of-the-art capitals, the regulating capitals, by paying below wa average wages, intensifying work through speed up, subdivision of tasks, and the like. Contrary to the co popular usage, primitive accumulation is not the accumulation of wealth through plunder, slavery, and colonialism. Marx explicitly rejected this notion in capital arguing that it reduces the process of primitive accumulation to a morality play tale in which the frugal elite accumulate wealth 
to means fair and foul, while the lazy rascals are left with no choice but to labor for their betters. Instead, the creation and geographic expansion of capitalism requires the, direct tr the transformation of direct producers into wage workers and the means of production to capital. Now, most non-capitalist forms were based on the direct producers, mostly peasant households, effective possession of landed property and the non-producer's use of non-market coercion to appropriate surpluses from the direct producer. Neither the growth of markets nor the development of labor productivity can displace non-capitalist social relations and replace them with those of capitalism. Instead, the deployment of legal and political force, non-market compulsion, has historically been necessary to force producers to become market dependent and to compel the expropriated to sell their labor power. Now, why do the creation and reproduction of capitalist social relations necessarily give rise to racist ideology and practices, where humanity is purportedly divided into distinct groups with unchangeable characteristics that make one group inherently superior and the other inherently inferior? To answer this question, we need to discard the idea that politics and ideology are social superstructures separate and apart from the material base of the economy. Instead, these ostensibly superstructural elements are what part of what Ellen Wood analyzed as, quote, a continuous structure of social relations and forms with varying degrees of distance from the immediate process of production and appropriation, beginning with these relations and forms that constitute the system of production itself. The connections between base and superstructure can then be traced without con great conceptual leaps because they do not represent two essentially different and discontinuous orders of reality. From this perspective, ideology is not a free-floating set of cultural ideals or discourses separate and apart from the social relations that constitute social production. Nor is it mere propaganda imposed on a passive population through the media, schools, and the like. Instead, ideologies are best understood as the mental roadmap of lived experience, the vocabulary of day-to-day -day action and experience shaped by social relations. These mental roadmaps change as the lived experience of social re relations change through practice and conflict. Put another way, ideological notions and practices are co-constituted by the reproduction of specific social relations of production and form part of the internal relations of different modes of production. Now, capitalism is the first form of social labor in human history where exploitation takes place through what appears to be the exchange of equivalents in the labor market. Rather than relying on personal domination or other forms of non-market coercion, capitalists and workers confront one another on the labor market as owners of distinct commodities. Capitalists owning means of production, workers their labor power. Capitalists purchase their workers' capacity to work at its value, the historically constituted social conditions of the reproduction of labor power. However, as capitalists consume labor power, put workers to work in the labor process, workers are compelled to produce an ex value in excess of the value of their labor power. Now, the buying and selling of labor power gives rise to a very specific vocabulary of lived experience that spontaneously disguises exploitation and generalizes the notion of human equality. In Value, Price, and Profit, Marx noted that under slavery, all labor appears to be unpaid. And under serfdom, the division between paid and unpaid labor is clearly visible in the division of crops and labor. By contrast, under capitalism, quote, even the unpaid labor seems to be paid labor because the nature of the whole transaction is completely masked by the intervention of a contract. In capital, Marx identifies how this 
produces a distinctive mental roadmap of lived experience. As he put it, the sphere of circulation or commodity exchange, within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on, is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. It is the exclusive realm of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. However, once we leave this idealized world of commodity exchange and enter the real work world of capitalist production, accumulation, and competition, which necess they necessarily produce substantial inequalities, not only between capital and labor, but within the working class and between societies in the capitalist world economy. In pre-capitalist societies, I would argue, human inequality was assumed to be part of the order of things, inscribed in the relations of personal dependence and extra economic coercion. By contrast, the actuality of inequality must be explained under capitalism in a way that is compatible with the notion that human beings should be free and equal. This requires a renaturalization of differences, the division of humanity into groups with unchangeable characteristics, making some inherently superior, others inferior. Only if some sectors of humanity are less than fully human can either capitalists or groups of competing workers make sense of a society where all appear to be equal, but there is great inequality between and within classes. A similarly contradictory lived experience marks the process of the geographic expansion of capitalism. On the one hand, capitalist imperialism it's, presents itself to the world as universalizing the benefits of civilization, the fair and equal exchange of the market, and the blessings of capitalist improvement. Unfortunately for capital, the subordination of non-capitalist producers to market compulsion cannot be achieved on the basis of either fair and equal exchange or out-competing backward producers. Because again, non-capitalist exploiters and exploited have effective non-market possession of means of production and means of consumption. As a result, race becomes central to the mental roadmap, roadmap of lived experience that explains and justifies the violent explosion appropriation of non-capitalist producers and the establishment of capitalist social property relations around the world. Racial and gender differentiation are the most common ways that workers and capitalists attempt to navigate the contradictory lived experience of capitalism. Gender differences are ideologically reduced to biology. Gender is equated simply with sex sexual differentiation, which purportedly explains women's inherent inferiority to men. While race has no biological reality, the process of racialization, racialization, <coughs> excuse me, constructs social differences as permanent and unchangeable, whether these differences are deemed to be biological or cultural. Racialization naturalizes differences in physical appearance, religion, language, behavior, and the like. Racist ideology with its notion of inherent and unchangeable relations of inequality provides a potent mental roadmap for both capitalists and workers of the contradictory lived experience of the creation and reproduction of capitalism itself. Before capitalism, Humanity was seen to be divided by religion, heathens and believers, kinship and community, strangers and neighbors. Both tended to be highly flexible and changeable through conversion, adoption, and the like. In almost all non-capitalist forms of social labor, capitalist exploitation was indistinguishable from political, legal, and freedom, making inequality again appear natural. Pre-capitalist imperialism did not generally disrupt the direct producer's effective possession of means of production and subsistence, but transferred lordship, 
or politically regulated trade monopolies from one group of non-capitalist exploiters to another. Thus, the fluid character of othering provided an adequate understanding of the lived experience of these social and historical processes. Under capitalism, I would argue, race is born when ca characteristics that differentiate humans become unchangeable, permanent, and inherent. Now, I would argue that the inability to distinguish between capitalist and non-capitalist forms of differentiating people is a fatal flaw of Cedric Robinson's highly influential theorization of racial capitalism and of others who argue for a trans-historical European racism. In Greco-Roman antiquity, differences between so-called civilized and barbaric groups were often seen to be rooted in environmental factors that were interpreted to be inheritable. However, the inheritance of these acquired, acquired characteristics were not seen as constant and stable from a generation to another. In other words, putting people in a new physical environment could produce new social and behavioral characteristics. In other words, they were fluid and flexible. In addition, those claiming the existence of racialization in classical antiquity have not demonstrated that certain groups were excluded from political life as long as they paid rent, tribute, and taxes to their rulers. In fact, there's considerable evidence of Africans in particular being integrated to the Greek and Roman states as soldiers and political officials. Now, there is evidence of an early form of what one could call proto-racism that emerged in at least one region of pre-capitalist Europe. In the 14th and late 14th and early 15th century, Castile and Aragon, the expanding Christian monarchies that for, were forcibly expelled their Muslim rulers and Jew, those Jewish bankers who failed to convert to Christianity from their kingdoms. By the mid-15th century, as competition for venal office in the new absolutist monarchies intensified, Christians began to exclude Muslims and Jews who had converted from Christi to Christianity from the ranks of nobility and key public office. Converts, that was claimed, lacked purity of blood and could not produce detailed genealogical records demonstrating that their families had been Christians for several generations, records which had become a prerequisite for social advancement. With the unification of Spanish absolutism in 1492, the expulsion of Jews and Muslims who refused to convert, and the exclusion of conversos became generalized. Despite its emergence in late feudal Iberia, the generalization of race did not occur, occur across European absolutism, where the continued reality of non-market coercion made human inequality appear to be eternal. I would argue, following Theodore Allen and Edmund Morgan, that racial oppression in its modern form was crystallized two centuries later in the English colon capitalist colonization of Virginia. When legal freedom was the typical status of the laboring classes, as it was in Virginia before the 17th century, inequality was assumed. It was only when other forms of bonded labor, in particular indentured servitude, were abolished in, late eight, in early 18th century Virginia, that the enslavement of people of African descent needed to be explained and justified. The notion of race unchangeable characteristics that make groups inherently superior and inferior, justified the unfreedom of Africans alone in a society where legal freedom and equality were becoming the norm. While I would argue that plantation slavery in Virginia was a non-capitalist form, it emerged as part of the first wave of English capitalist colonization. <coughs> Excuse me. The breakthrough to capitalist agriculture in England in the 16th century had given rise to a mass consumer market. Merchants operating outside the declining system of royal monopolies sought to supply this growing market, initiating plantation production of sugar and tobacco in the English Caribbean and the southern North American mainland. While these new merchants were unable 
to establish capitalist social relations in their colonies. Their, these colonies were the extension of the first capitalist society, the first society where juridical legal freedom and equality was becoming the norm. Now, the framework I'm, I've tried to develop here and in the article that is the comrade so kindly translated into Portuguese and is also appearing in the journal Historical Materialism, I think actually provides a framework for future research. The specific forms of racist ideology and oppression, which specific characteristics make some groups superior and others inferior, vary according to the specific historical forms capitalist social relate of social capitalist social relations and their geographic expansion. This approach, I think, can help transcend what I see as the limits of the notion of racial formations. Such typologies as racial formations often take on a life of their own, life of their own, leading to attempts to assign distinctive dynamics to each idealized racial formation with a considerable loss of hysteric, historical specificity. Instead, we need to proceed from the abstract understanding of the necessity of racial oppression to capitalist reproduction and expansion, and then move to the concrete historically historical specificity of racial oppression and specific historically constituted capitalist societies. Finally, our analysis of capitalism and racial oppression has implications for socialist political practice. Racialized divisions within the working class cannot be simply seen as the product of capitalist manipulation, a divide and conquer strategy. Working class racism is actually rooted in the contradictory position of workers under capitalism. As Bob and Johanna Brenner pointed out almost 40 years ago, Workers are both collective producers with a potential common interest in taking collective control over social production, but they are also individualized sellers of labor power in conflict with one another over jobs, promotions, housing, education, and the like. As competing sellers of labor power, workers are open to the appeals that pit them against other workers, especially workers in weaker social positions. In other words, racist appeals to workers from whatever the source make sense to workers when collection, collective action against capital appears to be unrealistic. Multiracial working class unity has not been and will not be produced spontaneously. It will require the rebuilding of a culture of solidarity among working people. In this process, struggles for universal class-wide demands, higher wages, greater job security, universal social benefits not tied to employment, and the like, do reduce competition among workers. This is a necessary, but I would argue not sufficient condition for building a racially unified working class movement. We can see in the United States that the mainstream of the industrial union movement of the 1930s and 40s attempted to build a multiracial movement through colorblind appeals to workers. This, however, allowed racialized divisions to deepen and ultimately contribute to the failure to organize the U.S. South. Race-specific demands in today's context of the United States defunding and disarming the police, ending housing and residential segregation, plant and senior industry-wide seniority, affirmative action in hiring and promotion, full citizen, citizen rights for all immigrants upon arrival, and the end to racial harassment and discrimination on the job and in all aspects of the life will be essential to rebuilding to building a multiracial workers' movement. Historical, historical experience demonstrates as well that a multiracial wor workers' movement will require self-organizations of workers by workers of color within the broader labor movement. Finally, non-workplace struggles against racism, like the uprising we saw in the U.S. in the summer, spring and the summer of 2020, 
have radicalized workers and create the possibility of promoting multiracial unity. Effect, put simply, effective class organization and politics, the forging of working class unity among a necessarily racially heterogeneous class must include anti-racist politics and organizing. Thank you, comrades. Renata, por favor. Oi, é, 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 eu agradeço ao professor Charles Post. Thank you, Professor Post, for your speech. And now we will open for questions. Questions can be asked in Portuguese. They will be translated for the professors. But please, if you do have questions, please walk up to one of the microphones. You're all very shy today, she says. Organizing the questions. Good evening. I would like to thank the two professors for their comments. Here in Brazil, we have a very large group of women who are studying the theory of social reproduction. And my question is that, well, we have been working a lot on this topic of social reproduction. And we have several feminist groups who use this theory. And therefore, I would like to ask you, especially Nancy Fraser, but also Dr. Post, how have you positioned about the loss of social reproduction and the theory of social reproduction as a whole? Um, Professor Post mentioned some I didn't, don't remember the name and the a book we use as a reference, but we're trying to understand what is your position in this debate on the social reproduction theory. And if possible, please go into Nancy, the crisis of social reproduction. Nancy mentioned that, but you didn't go very deep. If you could um, elaborate on that, it would be very helpful to us. In just a moment, it seems that we have another question. Boa noite. Boa noite. É, eu estou no mesmo grupo que a Dani, é uma questão importante para nós, né? E uma das perguntas que eu ia fazer era essa, principalmente com a Nancy Fraser, se ela se considera mais uma interlocutora privilegiada da teoria da reprodução social ou se ela se entende como uma teórica da reprodução social. Essa é uma questão. E a outra, né, agradecendo muito as ambas as falas muito importantes para nós. Uh, the translation, é, there's something wrong with the translation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Could you ask her to repeat? É, pede pela rep... é. Aí queria ouvir dela se ela pudesse falar como é que está essa relação dela com o marxismo hoje. Você poderia repetir a pergunta porque não não teve a interpretação. Renata, 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 por favor. Atenção, Renata. Não, so let's. Well, he'll, they'll bring her back. Um, thank you very much, Professor Fraser, Professor Post, for your comments. I am José. I am a professor at the Federal Fluminense University. My question is very broad. I would like to hear about the situation of class struggles in the U.S., especially uh, and how it is dealing with the racial issue. 
Let us give the word to the professors now. Prof Professor Fraser first, and then Professor Post. If you could please ask her to repeat the question, the second one. Thank you. Hello, uh, pode pedir. Just a moment, we are arranging a problem here. Só um minuto, vamos corrigir um problema aqui. João, se possível, pedir para repetir a segunda pergunta. Obrigada. Renata, por favor, é, auditório, a gente precisa que seja repetida a segunda pergunta, ela não foi traduzida. Só um segundo que a, a Lívia, né? A Lívia já está vindo aqui. Please come. Up, Livia, she will repeat her question. Sorry about that. First of all, I would like to thank uh, both professors. And I want to say that my question is supplementary to the first question, because we are part of the same study group on the social reproduction theory. So I had two questions. The first is for Professor Fraser, whether you consider yourself an interlocutor, a privileged interlocutor of the social reproduction theory, or do you consider yourself a theoretician that uh, helps to build the social reproduction theory? Theory. My second question, also to Professor Fraser, is that during your intellectual history, there were different changes in the positioning about Marxism. I would like to know your current position about, market, about the Marxist theory. Okay, thank you uh, for all of these questions. They're, they're interesting and, and challenging. Um, so, uh, on social reproduction theory, um, well, I mean, for uh, for me, that is um, a sort of semi-euphemistic code word for Marxist feminism, which I, uh, among which I count myself, and I am thrilled um, to see this um, e enormous revival of Marxist feminism in the guise of social reproduction theory, or whatever else we call it um because you know in 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 my uh lifetime uh um you know uh i i lived for the initial flowering of marxist feminism in the 19 late 60s early 70s and so on and then the sort of gradual uh marginalization of this uh in um favor of uh, on the one hand a a, a kind of strange love affair with the uh, post-structuralist feminism, French feminism, and so on, uh, and the general hegemony of, of liberalism and liberal feminism. So I am, I feel that, you know, for the first time in decades, I'm now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of feel myself represented by in the development of feminism. Um, it, and I, uh, just to to focus first on the on the second question, um, so I consider myself a, a a Marxist feminist, but but also an eco Marxist, and and you know and, and so on. So I, I would say that's all I am, um, and uh, so I'm not sure how to parse that the way you pose the question. Am I a privileged interlocutor of it, or am I a, a social reproduction? theorist um i'm not i don't quite even get the distinction uh but what i would say is that um i i'm primarily a a theorist of capitalism i think it's impossible to be a critical theorist of capitalism without uh giving an important uh place in the structure of capitalism to social reproduction and to the whole problematic of gender uh, and in, in, on this point, I think I'm, I'm very much in agreement with what Charles Post said that, uh, you know, in the same way, uh, you can't be a theorist of capitalism without being a theorist of, of race and racism as well and, and seeking to understand its structural place as a fundamental uh, characteristic of, of capitalism, a constitutive character, uh, characteristic. So, um, 
uh, that means that, uh, as you saw, I, I, I do believe that we are in a one of these relatively rare uh, periods of a general crisis of capitalism, of the form of capitalism that we have today. And I do think a social reproduction crisis uh, in the feminist sense is, is very much an important uh, part of that. So my work in trying to understand this crisis is quite parallel to what I said about the crisis of, of democracy, right? The, the argument that I gave in my lecture was that you can't understand this as a freestanding uh, crisis of the political order, as a sectoral crisis. You have to understand this as a strand of the general crisis of capitalism and give a, uh, a a diagnosis and an analytic uh, account of where that comes from. I would say the same thing about social reproduction crisis. Um, I, I think that there there if if there is a a danger in the current revival of interest in social reproduction, it's that it it gets you know lifted out of the the matrix of 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 the critical theory of capitalism and treated as a thing unto itself in the same way that democratic theorists treat democratic crisis as a thing unto itself we we don't want uh, a a feminist theory that disconnects the current crisis of social reproduction which is severe and and highly problematic from these other strands and that's why I've been very impressed with the development of um, a kind of um, sort of anti-austerity, social reproduction, radical feminism in Brazil and in Argentina at present. Uh, I think you guys have done much better than we in the United States have at um, really... Um, you know, parsing out the connecting the dots between finance, austerity, the the cuts in social services, and this and and and, uh, and this uh, social reproduction crisis, and connecting that up to the the general form of capitalism that we are living in. So that's the sort of um, social reproduction theory that I'm interested in. The, the, this uh, connecting the dots kind of theory. And in general, uh, the question of my relation to Marxism, um, I don't feel my relationship to, to Marxism has changed, um, uh, but I think that the place of Marxism in what passes for left-wing thinking has changed. Um, because, you know, I came of age in, in the 60s when you know, everybody was an anti-capitalist. The whole new left, however deeply or shallowly or whatever one understood Marxism, one sort of claimed to be part of it. Uh, and as I just said about Marxism, feminism, that subsequently became a a, a bit of a, you know, a, a, a wilderness, a small uh, group of people uh, on the on the fringes. So Marxism is back now, which is great. But then the question becomes, which Marxism? And uh, just as Charles, you know, uh, gave us a nice uh, account of the many varieties of uh, theories of, uh, about the relation of race and class, um, now we have, you know, uh, a whole set of Marxisms that one could affiliate to. And what I think is is very interesting is that everybody, uh, there does seem to be a consensus emerging. Um around the idea which Charles mentioned of a heterogeneous working class, the idea that we're not just talking about factory workers and, uh, you know, the sort of iconically uh, exploited trade unions and so on, but about people who are not paid for their work or people who do what you could call sub work or se semi-free, if not wholly enslaved work, uh, uh, work that is not paid for the cost of the workers uh, reproduction, which exploited work is supposed to be paid for. Um, uh, so so we have we, the, what what counts as a worker, what counts as class, um, I think is uh, we're getting a much more uh, inclusive kind of view about that. And what I've been trying to do is um, 
is offer a kind of theorization of those relations, because I too, like Ellen Wood, think that we need a, a general theory of capitalism. I don't think she, uh, she, she, as you saw, I, you know, uh, sort of am happy to use elements of her, her theory of that, but I don't think as a, in, in totality, it was uh, sufficient. So in any case, I, I see myself as, um, as a as as a as providing a, a a Marxist theory of capitalist society that, as I said, has an expanded view of capitalism and tries to, you know, connect connect some of these dots and class struggle in the United States. Just briefly, I want to save time uh, for Charles. Um, I would say um, it's it's a it, it's an it's an interesting time and it takes many forms. Um, of course, we have to define what we mean by class and what we mean by uh, class struggle. And um, my view is that all sorts of things that might have earlier been thought of anti-racist struggle in a way that was not class struggle or feminist struggle that was not class struggle, I think all of that now we are seeing it once you connect the dots. These are forms of class struggle, which are potentially at least anti-capitalist. Uh, they are all, all forms of class struggle that are not explicitly anti-capitalist. And the question is, will they develop into anti-capitalist forms of class struggle uh, or even socialist forms of class struggle, whatever. Um, it's interesting that we are seeing a uh, uh, not just um, you know the manufacturing sector in the United States is right is a declining uh, sector of the economy, and for a long time the unions uh, in that sector were very much on the defensive and cutting all kinds of um, very sad sorts of deals to to, to keep uh, jobs of of some ex some workers afloat and so on. Um, there are some uh, new energy there. Um, but in addition, there's, in fact, we may even be seeing an auto uh, strike uh, uh, on Monday. Uh, first one in a long time, although it's going to be a very limited strike, apparently. Um, but also, we're now seeing organizing activity in retail, in distribution, and in social reproductive uh, labor that is paid labor, teachers, nurses, hospital workers, uh, all of that, Amazon warehouse workers, Starbucks workers, uh, fast food, um, um, hotels, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the face of the of class struggle, I would say, has changed. It is no, no longer sort of dominated by the, the major uh, powerful unions in the manufacturing sector. They're part of the story, but it's a much more a variegated picture, that heterogeneous uh, working class. We're now seeing heterogeneous forms of class struggle. And then the challenge would be to also um, try to um, think about um, uh, struggles over prisons and police and abortion rights, which, by the way, if, if abortion rights are not labor rights, then our definition of labor is much too narrow. Uh, Me Too is obviously a labor struggle. Uh, th there are all sorts of things that are, uh, are class struggles and labor struggles that are not usually named as such. But if, if we can connect these dots, not only in theory, but in the sort of consciousness of uh, those people engaged in these struggles, we could get a much more powerful sense of what the working class is, of what class struggles look like, and what the potential alliances are, at least, uh, uh, if nothing else, based on the shared common enemy and the need for cooperation and coordination to develop the, the heft and vision necessary to transform society. Um. <clears throat> Let me start, as Nancy did, with the sort of theoretical question of the, you, you asked, what, what is my relationship to social reproduction theory? And I think for me, I think like Nancy, what social reproduction theory did, particularly in the pioneering work of Lise Vogel, was an attempt to move beyond 
the notion that capitalism constitutes this narrow economic system defined by market relations. And instead to understand capitalism as an ensemble of necessary social relations rooted in certain relations that organize the process of social production, but then necessarily give rise to certain relations to reproduce human beings day to day, intergenerationally, etc. In other words, and on a theoretical level, this allowed, opened the door, which was unfortunately quickly shut in the, in the early 80s, almost as soon as Vogel's book came out, to a notion, to going beyond seeing exploitation, oppression, political domination as separate systems of, of se separate systems that somehow would intersect. That's, I think, the great, that and the great strength of social reproduction theory was it pointed to that the working class as a totality included both those who were directly employed by capital producing surplus value, whether the, those activities, and those engaged in what were had previously been seen as privatized social reproduction. Now, my own work, I think that aspects of so the analysis of social reproduction and different modes in which working people reproduce their capacity themselves day to day and intergenerationally is very important in understanding how various layers of the reserve army of labor are in fact racialized. Migrants, immigrants, workers who maintain some ties to the countryside, who, whose households and kinship networks reproduce themselves through petty trade, etc., and who are also engaged in social production. My own work takes that as a sort of framework and tries to look at how processes that are seen usually as narrowly economic, narrowly market-defined, and as homogenizing competition, accumulation, and the expansion of capitalism globally are in fact processes that are social, conflicted, and themselves necessary contribute to the creation of a heterogeneous working class. That it is the process of accumulation itself that constantly reproduces layers of people who are outside or have tenuous connections to the wage relations. And it constantly differentiates those of us who do have waged employment in terms of not only wages, but in terms of working conditions, uh, security of employment, etc. So for me, that's the, the social reproduction theory both has a direct impact key to understanding certain aspects of how race and racism are reproduced under capitalism and it, social reproduction theory provided a methodological and political framework for me to start to develop these thinking about race. Um, in terms of the situation of the class struggle in the U.S. Um, and race in particular, I think we have to start with the bad. The bad is that the working class as a whole both its organized and unorganized sectors have, since the late 70s, been under, under siege. The traditional institutions of working class organization, the industrial unions, etc., have been massively decimated. And in fact, a slight difference I'd have with Professor Frazier is that, in fact, the union membership has dropped much more rapidly than membership in than actual number of manufacturing or industrial workers. So what we've seen is a is a shredding of the what had always been inadequate forms of organization, but which had maintained some levels of at least job level or industry wide solidarity, etc. As these institutions crumbled, and as capital goes against the offensive not only against workers at work, but this, the austerity offensive, which de, you know, massively impoverishes people, pushes almost all responsibility for social reproduction onto individualized working class households, etc. This created a very, very fertile environment for the growth of working class racism. 
which has been manifested by a minority of workers, mostly older men, white older men, voting for right-wing candidates going back to the early 1980s. Now, while I believe that the new right from Reagan through the Trumpist era, its base is mostly in sections of the traditional middle class, the small business, et cetera, and non-college educated layers of semi-professional supervisors, et cetera, who are also being squeezed, a significant, a minority of older workers are in fact being attracted to these ideas. And in the wake of defeats, these ideas will have greater resonance. So for example, the fact that the Democratic Party, which is supposed to be the party of working people in the U.S. and never was, including self-proclaimed socialists in Congress, voted to impose a, co a concessionary contract on railway workers this year, is giving the right wing, hard right po pseudo populists, a audience among railway workers who believe that, in fact, it's the Democrats, the left, et cetera, who are selling them out. And the only people who are speaking for good, white, hardworking, quote, white workers are the hard right. So that's the neg that's the reality. Racism within the working class is much more visible and vibrant today than it was when I I'm about 10, years, probably about 10 or 15 years, the junior of, of, of Nancy, but I too radicalized in the 60s and 70s, and it's much worse today than it was then. Now, the the high the good point is there has been waves of fightbacks, some successful, most unsuccessful, starting with Occupy, the Wisconsin uprising, the the Red State Teachers Revolt in the summers of, of 2017 and 2018, and the massive the the anti-racist Black Lives Matter rebellion, which was, as far as I'm concerned, a form of working class struggle against the po police brutality of the most vulnerable sectors of the working class. I believe this has had a radicalizing effect on young working people, and they bring the some of the, the radical ideas and experiences that they've had in these uprisings to the workplace. I think it's been manifested in a variety of ways, some effective, some ineffective. We've seen in two of the largest continuously existing industrial unions in the U.S., the Teamsters and the auto workers, the election of reform leaderships, okay, uh, of reform leaderships. Unfortunately, the reform leadership in the Teamsters capitulated on the railway strike and, I believe, settle for much less than what was needed, particularly by part-time workers who are disproportionately young and disproportionately non-white, a contract that sold that gave them very little. I am hopeful and I am also somewhat discouraged when, by the UAW leadership, new UAW leadership talking about partial strikes rather than an industry-wide strike if they do not get a contract by this evening. What's encouraging is this new waves of organizing that Nancy mentioned, whether it's at Starbucks, whether it's among nurses and teachers, the new militancy there, but particularly in the logistics industry. Amazon workers, workers in warehousing, transport, etc., I would not classify as service workers. I would say, in fact, they're industrial workers. And they have they, if they were able to organize and, most importantly, win, they have social power to disrupt society that could change the relationship of forces and make other sectors of, of the working class who have less social, less capacity to disrupt things, encourage them to take action as well. So in the U.S. today, we're in a very contradictory situation. We're still dealing with four or five decades of defeat and what it means for deepening racialized divisions among working people. But there are these small green sprouts of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have 15 minutes, but our speakers uh, have a deadline. 
at 7.30 local time, 6.30 uh, Eastern time. So there's one question in the other auditorium. I will ask you to be very brief, please, because we have to close in 15 minutes. So I also ask uh, the professors to conclude, uh, make your final remarks also to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Fraser and Mr. Post to also uh, in their answers uh, give their conclusions. So good evening. So my question is addressed to Professor Fraser. It is not exactly about her presentation, but regarding democracy in one of her uh, works, articles. In uh, Justice Interrupted, you suggest that for the good working of the public sphere, essential for egalitarian democracy, it will be necessary to have uh, a, a better uh, balance uh, between uh, different institutions. Especially in these last few years, we have seen a growth in a delegitimization of science, of democracy, by the treatment of specific uh, worldviews with uh, questionable realities, uh, with the private entry of uh, public spheres. Considering this, a greater porosity of these areas, that wouldn't this make these issues greater that been very harmful to democracy? I apologize, he was reading so fast. I hope you got the meaning of that. Okay, do you want me to speak now? Yes, please, Nancy. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I got uh, most of it, I think, and, and, and thank you. Um, I, think that, um, I think that what you describe about the delegitimation of science and democracy, the rise of, you know, often truly unhinged, uh, <laughs> you know, conspiracy <laughs> thinking, uh, all these uh, strange views about COVID and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, that's all true. But I think the, the question for me is, um, uh, what's a, an effective right left wing response to that? And uh, all I can say for sure is that what is not a good response is a sort of, you know, a intellectual superiority, a condescending uh, uh, view of, uh, you know, how stupid these people are, how evil they are. Uh, in other words, the standard liberal, you know, get on your high horse, high ground kind of thing. That That is uh, how most people I know in, in US academia uh, think about this. And uh, this is, we, we are here uh, because we're interested in Marxism uh, and um, the, uh, that is not a Marxist response to this. A Marxist response to this has to um, think about um, uh, what is it uh, about the way our social system is operating that has unmoored people from what was a kind of, you know, not a, at all emancipatory, but a secure form of bourgeois hegemony. We had a relatively secure form of bourgeois hegemony, which limited uh, opposition and, and what could be questioned, uh, both for the left and for the right to some degree. And th that hegemony is now in tatters. And so we're getting a kind of, you know, the, this um, pouring out of uh, all kinds of, let's use a, a neutral term, out of the box thinking, uh, including some that is potentially emancipatory, but, you know, uh, all of the kind of stuff that you described, the, the, uh, the crazy stuff. So, um, we need an account of, um, of of how the social system, how the expanded reproduction of this form of capitalism as a system has unraveled the bases of hegemony. I, it, it, I, I don't see um, much point in actually trying to debate these people you know, about whether vaccines cause COVID or not. Uh, I don't want to have a debate with, with Robert Kennedy Jr., who is the only opposition, alas, to Biden <laughs> uh, within the, the Democratic Party. Um, uh, but uh, I do think that um, that by, you know, sh explaining why the conditions of life are deteriorating, 
why people don't feel loyalty to this social system anymore, why they are searching for something radical. Uh, and, and, and alas, in a country like the United States, where there isn't a, a real transmission or institutionalization of left-wing thinking that is accessible to most working people, why every generation of radicals has to somehow reinvent it or rediscover it because it's not been transmitted. That's a whole story about the role of McCarthyism and earlier and so on and so forth that interrupts those, those lines of transmission. We're now just trying to sort of rebuild some institutions of left culture and left thinking. I guess one should give a shout out to Jacobin and, you know, this uh, attempt to sort of create a whole uh, ecosystem of uh, left-wing thinking. Um, you know, what, however much you, um, you know, admire or don't admire various <laughs> aspects of it. Um, nevertheless, um, with, without um, that kind of uh, ability, um, this is what I, what, what, I, what I was talking about when I mentioned counter hegemony. We need a counter hegemonic response to the deterioration of life for everyone, which takes different forms for different people. Uh, and um, within that, um, th you know, th that's the only way, I think, to counter this stuff. The liberal response is only, you know, uh, sort of, what, what's the, the term? It, 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 it's a, it's a it, it, part of the vicious cycle. The, the liberals created this mess and uh, now they're condescending, you know, um, moralizing uh, critique of it is, is not the answer. Leave it at that. Thank you. Now, Charles, if you... Uh, yes, I mean, the question wasn't directed to me, but I want to sort of take up and expand on things Nancy said, because I completely agree with Nancy that these, that... The liberals' response of these people are what? What? How did Cl Hillary Clinton the? Um. Oh, Jesus! My mind's a basket of deplorables. Deplorables that they're just simply deplorables. You know, these are you know America's always been great, etc. We have to understand as Marxian materialists maintain a materialist approach to ideology. These ideas actually make sense of the lived experience of a significant minority of people in capitalist societies around the world. And we have to get at what is it that lived experience? It's a lived experience, I think, the appeal of conspiracy theories, anti-science stuff, etc., is these many of these people are people who always believed and actually did play by the rules. They worked hard. They sought individual advancement. Some of them became small business people. They got skills. They had decent jobs, et cetera. And in the last 30, 40 years, all of this is going to pop. And particularly in the, since 2008, all of this has been going into the toilet. Their, their lives having become significantly worse and more precarious. Given that their position in society is one of we we followed the rules, but it's not working, then it must be the problem is not with the rules, with the system, it's with these evil elites, financiers, scientists, well, financiers, globalist corporations, i.e., read the Jews. These are the people who are behind us. This is why these ideas make sense. And Nancy is absolutely correct. Trying to lecture these people that they're simply ignorant and stupid is the height of a liberal elitism, and it covers up the liberal capitalist, the liberals' own culpability for the social crisis we're facing today and their system's culpability. I absolutely agree that building a counter hegemony where people ha have organizations, activities, publications, etc., which allow them to understand that the world is truly screwed up but there is an alternative a progressive democratic collectivist alternative to this is crucial but i would just add that that will be built primarily through new waves of struggle counter hegemonic organizations 
around the world, working class and popular organizations that maintained a working class subculture of resistance and, and dissent always arise out of mass struggles. And it's going to be the revival of those mass struggles, whether they take the form of new uprisings against police brutality, do workplace struggles, struggles to re, to re win the right to vote, the right to abortion, etc. All of these will be crucial. And with out of these struggles have to come new democratic organizations that can carry on, that can maintain activity between the big explosions and build that counter hegemony. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh. Renata. Renata. I would like to thank Professor Post, Professor Nancy Fraser for participating in our event. And we are adjourning our session and thanking our public and also apologizing for not being able to open for more questions as we have along the week tomorrow we will begin we will begin at 2 p.m with a mini course and then our traditional uh, final ceremony and thank you all and we'll see you tomorrow <laughs>